Um, so for this 30-minute session, the things I want to address are physiologic changes of pregnancy, um, uterine blood flow and uterine placental perfusion, maternal fetal drug and oxygen transfer, and then just briefly talking about um, analysis of umbilical cord blood gases. And as we go along, I'm going to have a few questions interspersed that you can just shut out the answers if you want, and if you don't, I'll just tell you what the answers are. So going into the physiologic changes of pregnancy and cardiovascular changes. So when is cardiac output of a parturient at its highest level? Is it the first stage of labor, right after delivery, second stage of labor, or second trimester? What? Immediately postpartum, exactly, that is correct. So, and then another cardiac question, which of the fine is most likely to represent an abnormal finding in a woman who's at 38 weeks gestation, so essentially at term? Is it that um, she has left axis deviation on her EKG, um, that her PA pressures are like 22 millimeters of mercury, that she has mild tricuspid regurge, or that she has a third house heart sound when you listen to her heart? So which of those would be abnormal? That's correct. It's that the PA pressure is elevated. All the other changes as a result of physiologic changes of pregnancy um, can occur. So let's talk about that. So cardiac output increases throughout pregnancy. By the third trimester, cardiac output has increased about 50% above um, pre-pregnancy levels. And this occurs predominantly from an increase in stroke volume, although you also see a small increase in heart rate. And then during labor and delivery, you see further increases. And this is why if you have a patient with underlying cardiac disease, even if they have tolerated pregnancy so far up until the time of labor and delivery, you worry about how they will manage during the labor and delivery process because there are further increases. So during the active phase of labor, someone's five, six centimeters dilated, you'll see another 30% increase in cardiac output. Into the second stage of labor when they're pushing, it's about a 45% increase. And then in that immediate postpartum period where you have um, autotransfusion as the uterus involutes, you have as much as an 80% further rise in cardiac output above and beyond the 50% that you saw just as a result of the pregnant state. Um, other cardiovascular changes, you see a significant increase in blood volume by about 35% due predominantly to an increase in plasma volume. You do see a, a small decrease in SVR of about 20%. And so in um, women, at least earlier in their pregnancy, you can actually see mild decreases in blood pressure compared to their baseline before pregnancy. But as that one question noted, um, despite the increase in blood volume, you also have vas vasodilation, and so you should not see changes in your central pressure. So if your pulmonary um, artery pressures, your CVP are elevated, that is abnormal. Um, let's move on to some other physiologic changes of pregnancy besides cardiac. So which of the following is most likely to be decreased in a healthy parturient at 36 weeks? Is it her total red blood cell volume, tidal volume, serum creatinine level, or factor eight level, factor seven level? C, that is correct. So serum creatinine level is going to be decreased. Um, one thing to be aware of in terms of the total red blood cell volume is that it does increase. You do have a dilutional anemia of pregnancy because you have a relatively greater increase in your plasma volume, but you do also have an increase in your red blood cell volume. So let's first talk about respiratory changes. So minute ventilation at term is increased by as much as 50%. Do, um, predominantly due to the increase in tidal volume. Similar to cardiac output, it's predominantly the stroke volume. Um, again, with this, it's more so an increase in tidal volume, although you do see a small increase in respiratory rate in pregnancy also. Um, in terms of your lung volumes and capacities, your, your ERV and your RV are decreased during pregnancy. Your inspiratory reserve volume is slightly increased. Um, one thing to keep in mind, Due to those decreases in ERV and RV is that your FRC is decreased by about 20%, and that's in a normal pregnant woman essentially sitting up. Um, you put the patient in supine position, say for a C-section, you'll see a further decrease in FRC, and if they have other morbidities such as um, 
morbid obesity, then you may see even further decreases in functional residual capacity. Your total lung capacity and vital capacity, though, should be unchanged in pregnancy in a normal pregnant patient. Um, oxygen consumption is increased during pregnancy um, by about 20%, and then during labor, um, you know, there's a reason it's called labor, and so you see as much as 100% increase in oxygen consumption during that time. What about oxygen delivery? Well, um, you know, when you think about physiologic changes in pregnancy, it's probably good to think about, you know, what would be advantageous to that fetus? And if it's advantageous to the fetus, it's probably happening during pregnancy. So in terms of the maternal oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve, you will see a right shift of that curve because it's going to fit, that right shift will facilitate oxygen delivery to the fetus. Uh, so those are some more of the respiratory changes. Now, um, so we've talked about what happens. So what do you expect to be a normal blood gas in a pregnant woman? Um, are you going to see a change? Is it going to be the same as in a non-pregnant patient? What do you expect? So the answer is that you are going to see um, some changes, but, but very small. So you will see um, a, a decrease in your CO2. Um, and normal CO2 is going to be somewhere between 26 to 32 due to that significant rise in minute ventilation that you see. Um, however, patients don't become markedly alkalotic because there's also a metabolic compensation for that that results in a decrease in your serum bicarb. So you will see a minimal respiratory alkalosis like around 7.44, but you know, you're not going to see anything really marked. Um, you will see a small increase in your baseline PaO2 also. So if we go back to this one, the, I guess it won't go back. Oh, there we go. So the correct answer would actually be D. So you have a small rise in your pH, a, a bigger decrease in your um, end tidal CO2, um, and a small decrease in your, um, your serum bicarbonate. So just keep that in mind when you're looking at blood gases in pregnant women, is that if you have a CO2 that's normal in a non-pregnant patient, that patient's already beginning to retain CO2. Um, let's move on to gastrointestinal changes of pregnancy. Um, the hormonal changes of pregnancy include a significant rise in progesterone, and it's responsible for multiple of the physiologic changes of pregnancy that occur. In terms of GI changes, what does that increase progesterone does? It reduces your lower esophageal sphincter tone. Um, you also have mechanical changes from the displacement of the um, of the stomach by the gravid uterus that can result in an increase in your intragastric pressure, as well as distort your GE junction, and that's a major part of why pregnant women oftentimes have significant gastric reflux. Um, but when you combine all of these things, the bottom line is, in terms of clinical implica implications, is that um, you do have generally considered pregnant women to be at increased aspiration risk because of all these various GI changes. In terms of hematologic changes, as I mentioned, you do see um, a rise in red cell mass by about 20%, but a much larger rise in your plasma volume by about 45%, and that is why you get what we call the dilutional anemia of pregnancy, where a normal hematocrit in a pregnant woman is going to be around 35%. If you have a preeclamptic patient and you get a, a hemogram and her crit is 40 or 41, you might want to say, oh, that's great, but re in reality that probably means she's intravascularly depleted and she has has concentrated. Um, in terms of other hematologic changes, key thing to remember is that pregnancy is a hypercoagulable state, and in fact, pulmonary embolism is a leading cause of maternal mortality um, in the U.S. and throughout the world. Um, this one is the various coagulation factors. I'm not going to go over all of it, but this was one of the new key words from last year. But um, being hypercoagulable, the vast majority of your coagulation factors are going to increase. Um, it's probably easier to remember which ones don't increase, so that factor 2 and factor 5 are relatively unchanged, and factor 11 and 13 are decreased. All your other factors are going to be increased. On a tag, you're going to have, for a pregnant normal patient, it's going to look like a hypercoagulable tag um, for a normal pregnant patient. Uh, what about some other... Um, 
coagulation parameters. Platelet count is generally unchanged or a small percentage of women will have what we call gestational thrombocytopenia where you will see a decrease, decrease in platelet count, but this is generally not clinically significant. It's rare that it would be less than 100,000. Plasminogen is increased and interstelline fibrin degradation products are actually increased in pregnancy. In terms of CNS changes, the things that are most important to us is that the MAC of volatile anesthetics is decreased by about 30 to 40 percent, and um, peripheral nerves are also have an increased sensitivity to local anesthetic, again, thought to be related to those increased progesterone levels. Same reason for the decrease in MAC is that the progesterone levels, high levels, have a, a depressant effect on the CNS. Um, so local anesthetic requirements can also be decreased. In addition, endorphin and enkephalin levels are elevated in pregnancy, um, and this results in an elevated pain threshold overall in the pregnant patient compared to the non-pregnant patient. In terms of renal changes, you have a significant rise in, um, in GFR, um, and creatinine clearance is increased, and that is why a normal creatinine in a pregnant patient, keep in mind, is about 0.5 to 0.6. So again, if you have a preeclamptic patient and her creatinine is one, you might think of that as being normal. But in fact, since she's pregnant, that's a sign that you have a component of renal dysfunction due to your preeclampsia. Now, moving on to uterine blood flow. The uterus is not capable of autoregulation. So what that means is, is that your uterine perfusion and then extrapolating to that your uteral placental perfusion is going to be dependent on inadequate driving pressure, meaning an adequate maternal blood pressure, low uterine venous pressure, and low uterine vascular resistance. So those are the things that are going to affect your uterine perfusion. So, um, you know, our biggest concern really is the uteral placental perfusion and how that affects the fetus. So what is going to decrease uteral placental perfusion? Well, it's probably a, you know, a no-brainer that a low uterine artery pressure, mom is hypotensive, that's going to decrease your uteral placental perfusion. However, other things that we don't think about that can also affect uteral placental perfusion are going to include an increase in your uterine venous pressure, and that can be affected by vena cable compression, contractions, especially uterine hypertonus, and if um, you've ever been on labor and delivery and mom starts having some D cells, you might note that um, the nurses turn the Pitocin off. The reason for that is to um, try to improve uteral placental perfusion by, by decreasing the contractions of uterine hypertonus. Valsalva maneuvers also will increase uterine venous pressure. And then increases in uterine vascular resistance will also result in a decrease in your uteral placental perfusion. And this can be um, due to vasoconstrictors, both endogenous and exogenous. Uh, just keep in mind, though, that if you're using a local anesthetic with epinephrine, 1 to 200,000, if you are actually injecting that into the correct place, into the epidural space, that will not um, have an effect. That, if anything, will cause vasodilation. Um, but Intravascular um, vasopressors can increase uterine vascular resistance. Uh, high concentrations of local anesthetic, if you inadvertently inject your local anesthetic um, intravascularly. Preeclampsia is a, a prime cause of increased uterine vascular resistance, and diabetics also can have an increase in, in the uterine vascular resistance. Um, now, choice of vasopressor. So you have a mom who's hypotensive. You know that's going to decrease your uteral placental perfusion. So there's ephedrine and there is phenylephrine. So ephedrine, as you remember, has both alpha and beta effects. So it is going to have less of an increase in uterine vascular resistance compared to phenylephrine. Um, and so you would think that might be preferred. And in fact, many years ago, like when I was training, we were taught that ephedrine was the vasopressor of choice in OB. The reason being that phenylephrine has a pure alpha effect. And so that was thought to worsen your uterine vascular resistance. However, studies over the past several years have now found that actually if you look at umbilical cord pH, which is a, a measure of the, the fetal status, that it's higher in babies whose moms receive phenylephrine compared to ephedrine. The reason for that um, has nothing really to do with this effect on uterine vascular resistance. It's rather the fact that ephedrine, a significant amount of ephedrine, 
crosses the placenta to the fetal side, and essentially it increases the fetal metabolism as a result of that ephedrine. So that is why, despite the fact that intuitively it thinks, seems like ephedrine would be the better drug, that phenylephrine is now our preferred vasopressor. Now, what about maternal fetal drug transfer? We're giving drugs. Are they going to get over to baby? Are we concerned about that? So things to remember about what's going to affect the placental transfer of drugs that have been given to mom. One is going to be the concentration of the drug in the mom. The higher the concentration, the, the greater the transfer. And then the drug diffusion constant is going to affect transfer. And so what does that mean? It means that if, it's, if the drug is small in its molecular your size, it's going to transfer more easily. If it has a low amount of protein binding, because only the unbound component of a drug is going to cross the placenta. If it's highly lipid soluble, it's going to have um, much more transfer. And if it um, has a low degree of ionization, because again, only the unionized form of the drug can cross over to the fetal side. Um, other things that will affect maternal fetal drug transfer include whether or not the drug binds within the placenta, as well as placental metabolism. For instance, a lot of the oxygen that gets delivered from mom to the placenta does not get delivered to the fetus because the placenta likes to use up that oxygen also. Um, other factors that will alter placental perfusion include aortal, vagal, aortal cable compression. Um, and hypovolemia, if mom is hypotensive, I mean, that's not good, but actually if she's hypotensive, there's going to be less transfer of drug over to baby. And then vasoconstrictors are also going to affect your placental perfusion. Um, once the, um, what about what factors are going to affect your fetal drug concentration? So um, once the drug gets over there, it's partly going to be affected by the metabolism. So unlike a mature um, enzyme pathways that you see on the maternal side, in the fetus, those pathways are immature, and so that will lead to um, elevated drug levels because the fetus is not able to metabolize the drugs as well as the mother. Um, fetal protein binding, there's less protein binding capacity on the fetal side compared to the mother, so this can lead to higher free drug levels. Um, and then fetal pH and the, ions, um, the ion trapping that we talk about also will affect the drug concentrations on the fetal side. And so um, talking about this, so you have a woman who's received labor epidural analgesia, and now they call you to the, the patient's room. They're going to the OR emergently for a C-section due to fetal bradycardia. So what do you want to dose her epidural with? Lidocaine, ropivacaine, chlorprocaine, or bupivacaine? C, chlorprocaine. Exactly. And why is that? It's because of this idea of ion trapping. So if you have fetal distress, you can assume that fetus is acidotic. So in the acidotic fetus, the local anesthetic that is crossed over to the fetal side is going to become ionized in that acidotic environment. And once it's ionized, as we said, it can't cross over to back over to the maternal side. So you will get a fetal accumulation of that local anesthetic, which, if it gets high enough, can lead at the time of delivery to a floppy baby. The reason that chlorprocaine is your drug of choice in fetal distress is that chlorprocaine is metabolized so quickly, it has such a short maternal half-life, that there's minimal drug transfer for the, to the fetus of chlorprocaine. So you're not worried about that ion trapping that you would be with your other local anesthetics, which have significantly more um, transfer over to the fetal side. So the least amount of placental transfer will occur with which of the following anesthetic drugs? Anyone? It's going to be C, succinylcholine, because that, if you talk about it, it's a large molecule. So some frequently asked questions about drug transfer and such have included what drugs don't cross the placenta in significant amounts. So your neuromuscular blocking drugs, um, you see uh, minimal transfer because they're both high molecular weight and ionized, so they rarely are going to affect neonatal motor tone. Um, Heparin is a large water-soluble molecule, so you don't see placental transfer because you have both water solubility, large molecule, and insulin is also a very large molecule with no um, placental transfer. 
Uh, sometimes I've asked about the maternal fetal distribution of bupivacaine, and this might um, seem a little bit um, tricky. So there's a high degree of maternal protein binding and a high PKA. So actually, you have relatively limited transfer of bupivacaine, less so than some of your other local anesthetics to the fetus. However, once that bupivacaine gets over to the fetal side, uh, there's much less protein binding, so you get more of the free drug on the fetal side. So in fact, despite the fact um, that you have relatively limited amount of fetal transfer of the bupivacaine, um, the amount of free drug will equilibrate with the maternal concentration due to the fact of that decreased protein binding. So the total fetal concentration of the drug is going to be less than the maternal concentration, but because of the lesser degree of, of protein binding, there will be a relatively equivalent concentration of active unbound drug. Um, placental transfer of anticholinergics has been asked in the past. Um, so this is going to directly correlate with the ability of the anticholinergic drug to cross the blood brain barrier. So what that means is, is that if you give atropine, that's going to easily cross and it can actually affect fetal heart rate. You can see an increase in your fetal heart rate if you give mom atropine. Uh, scop scopolamine, rare that we use it on OB, but it will easily cross. Glycopyrrolate, because it's a quaternary um, it has that quaternary structure, um, minimally crosses the placenta, and so you won't see the effect on fetal heart rate that you would if you gave atropine. What about maternal fetal oxygen transport? Um, as I mentioned, uh, or I, I guess I didn't mention, but placental oxygen transfer occurs essentially via diffusion. So the transport's going to be determined by the difference between the PaO2 in mom and PO2 in the, in the fetal circulation. Also keep in mind that there is also what we call the Bohr effect. And what this means is, is at the same time that oxygen is going from the maternal side to the fetal side, carbon dioxide is going from the fetal to maternal side. And that is going to make your maternal blood more acidic and your fetal blood more echolotic. That will lead to a right shift of the maternal hemoglobin ox maternal oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve um, and a left shift of the fetal curve. So that, again, is going to favor unloading of oxygen to the fetus. Um, it, one thing to keep in mind, though, is that in terms of a fetal PO2, you're never going to see it get above 50 to 60 millimeters of mercury. The reason for that is two. First of all, as I mentioned before, the placenta uses a lot of the oxygen that comes from the maternal side. And secondly, fetal arterial blood is actually a mixture of oxygenated umbilical venous blood and deoxygenated um, blood coming through the IVC. In terms of fetal hemoglobin and oxygen transport, fetal oxygenation is going to be determined by um, both the maternal fetal oxygen gradient and the differences in the type of hemoglobin. So hemoglobin F, has a, which is what your, the fetus is going to have, has a greater affinity for oxygen and a lower affinity for 2,3-DPG. So that leads to a leftward shift of the oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve on the fetal side. Um, and that results also in a P50 that is lower in fetal blood than in adult blood. So that hemoglobin F in the higher hemoglobin concentration leads to a fetal arterial blood oxygen concentration that's just minimally lower than the adult. Even though there's a lower oxygen tension, in terms of the concentration, it's going to be very similar. Um, at normal PAO2s, if you... Um, if you have a normal fetal PaO2, so baby's not hypoxic, it's not acidotic, um, if you increase the maternal FiO2, it's going to have only a slight increase in the fetal PaO2. However, if you have a baby that's become hypoxic, so showing signs of distress, now you're going to be on the steep part of the fetal oxyhemoglobin dissociation curve, and so increasing maternal FiO2 will be beneficial, will increase oxygen delivery to the baby. And that is why on labor and delivery, when moms start having um, D cells, you'll see the labor and delivery nurse slap oxygen on the mother. And then finally, umbilical cord blood gases. Um, these are what you would expect to be normal umbilical vein and umbilical artery. Things to remember is, is that the umbilical artery is what is showing you primarily what's happening on the fetal side. 
Umbilical vein is more about what's happening on the maternal side and within the placenta. So when they send cord gases, you're really most interested in the umbilical artery values. So these are the normal values that you would see. And what's really important is understanding um, the acidemias and how that is going to be associated with, um, with um, fetal outcomes. So if you have an umbilical artery, PA, uh, umbilical artery gas in which you have a high PCO2 but a normal bicarb and a normal base de deficit, that is a respiratory acidemia. If you have a normal PCO2, a low bicarb and a high base deficit, that is a fetal metabolic acidemia. Or frequently what you'll see is a mixed acidemia. So you have a high PCO2, so you have a, a respiratory component of the acidemia, but you also have a low bicarb and a high base deficit, so you also have a metabolic component. And what is important to know is that it is the, the metabolic acidemia and the mixed acidemias, which are associated with poorer neonatal outcome. Generally, if it's just a purely respiratory acidosis, um, that baby's outcome is generally not going to be affected. So that is part one of part three parts of OB um, keyword review.